When I was around five years old, I borrowed my older brother's copy of Pokemon Blue. I fell in love with it and sank so much time into it. And now when I think back to those times I spent playing the game, I realize they're actually some of the earliest memories I can recall. One time I'm sitting on the beach trying to play my Game Boy and I can barely see the dark screen under the glaring sunlight and sand everywhere but still a great time nonetheless. On some days, I would even take the handbook from the game to school. During recess, I would flip through it looking at all the cool pictures of Pokemon, like, you know, Pikachu and Growlithe and all that cool stuff. <laughs> so, it's safe to say I loved Pokemon a lot, and I still do, and it shaped my childhood and even some of my ways of thinking. Pokemon Red and Blue, and Yellow as well, are immensely impactful games on the lives of you know, hundreds of millions of people. And, and the first game goes between playing nice, cheerful music to intense battle tunes. And the player is comforted by beautiful green scenery, images of mountains, and friendly towns filled with gym leaders and trainers to challenge. However, there is one small portion of the game that separates itself quite a bit. And seeing as it's October and the spooky times are coming, I thought we'd discuss the strangest part of Pokemon Red and Blue, Lavender Town. Surprisingly so, my favorite area in Red and Blue was Lavender Town. Even as a kid, I was enthralled by the mysterious and strange town. It stuck out like nothing else in the game. As soon as you walk into the town, the images on the screen are shrouded in a mysterious purple mist. The music changes to a haunting and eerie tune. You're just met with this feeling that you're in a strange, unfamiliar place. There's no gym here, so there's no boss for you to fight. There's only a few houses, a Pokemon Center, and one major landmark to visit. Pokemon Tower. When you view the sign outside of Pokemon Tower, it reads, May the souls of Pokemon rest easy. It's now that we realize what Lavender Town is haunted by the specter of Pokemon Lost. The massive and haunting Pokemon Tower looms over Lavender Town as a monument to those Pokemon that have passed and seems to set the cryptic mood weighing upon the town. So, to put it quite bluntly, Lavender Town is simply a place where people are brought to deal with death which is not an easy ordeal to face. So we're going to set up some of the ways that death is presented to us in the first Pokemon games and analyze them with existentialist philosophy. More specifically, some existentialist concepts created by Jean-Paul Sartre, who is considered the daddy of existentialist philosophy. But more on that later on. First, we're gonna talk over the enigmatic Lavender Town. So without further ado, let's talk about death. Death inside the Pokemon universe is generally unremarked upon. In specific areas like Lavender Town and other small parts of other separate games, it's only briefly mentioned at all. Yet in Lavender Town, it's so present and in your face, it's quite clearly impossible to ignore. You are immersed into a sequence of sorrow, whereby nearly everyone you speak to in the town and inside of the tower makes mention of a death or a personal loss. This occurs almost nowhere else in the game or anywhere else in most of the Pokemon franchise. To introduce how I feel about Lavender Town, let's take a quick aside before we really explore the story being told there. Something that bothers me a lot about the cultural interpretations of Lavender Town is that while it's understood that this is a creepy and haunting area, and it's obvious that the town is meant to be separate and unique within the game, there seems to be this fetishization with fear-mongering around Lavender Town that just ruins the intrigue of it for me. It's really annoying when I look into Lavender Town, which seems to be fruitful of lore and interesting stories, and yet instead all I find are theories about kids killing themselves in Japan because the song is really creepy, which by the way isn't real, like all of that is nonsense. We've entirely missed the point with Lavender Town, it seems. I recognize that fear and sorrow and pain, they're all inextricable elements from death in s some degree. And loss is one of the most painful emotions we have to deal with, but we don't need to fetishize a fear of death in order to confront the loss itself. So in this town, death is considered sacred, and the Pokemon Tower actually holds the bodies of Pokemon who have passed. Yet, 
As a person experiencing the game, we're given the narrative that death is merely something to be petrified of, not something to be accepting of. From the iconically terrifying music to the remarks of the townspeople, you don't believe in ghosts? I guess not. That white hand on your shoulder, it's not real. It's clear that the intention of the developers was to create a town to be afraid of and to want to just quickly pass through and forget about. I understand they needed to be effective in striking the player with a strong emotion and that this is also a game for kids. <laughs> but I want to take a deeper dive into death and how we shouldn't necessarily just perceive it as something to be terrified of. So starting off in Lavender Town, we stop by the Pokemon House, which is a home run by Mr. Fuji for abandoned Pokemon. There's a couple of different abandoned Pokemon here, and in the animated version of it, there's actually a Cubone there who had lost its mother, Marowak, to Team Rocket. Team Rocket had been hunting Cubones to sell their skulls for profit, and in the process, were killing some of them. Mr. Fuji here seems to be missing, and we learn that he's somewhere in the Pokemon Tower, so we head on over there to investigate. Inside of the tower, the rooms are littered with gravestones of dead Pokemon. On the second floor, you meet with your rival, who remarks, What brings you here? Your Pokemon don't look dead. If you're familiar at all with, you know, Pokemon lore and theories, there's one that theorizes that your rival is there to mourn the loss of Eradicate that was previously in his party. In your last fight with your rival on the SS Anne, he uses Eradicate. And when you fight him here at the Pokemon Tower, that Eradicate is missing and you never see him again. So it's presumed that the Eradicate is dead. This ground has already been covered a whole lot, so I won't spend too long on it, but it does continue this strange and bizarre tone that the town gives us. He then remarks that he has caught a Cubo but can't find a grown-up Marowak. So I want to get into the details of why the Cubone and Marowak situation is so poignant and powerful to the tale of Lavender Town. Cubone is quite possibly the strongest and most apparent representation of death in the Pokemon universe. Cubone is a Pokemon born of death itself, as every Cubone wears the skull of its dead mother. The Pokemon Stadium description of Cubone reads, quote, always wears the skull of its deceased mother on its head and never shows its face. It cries mournfully in the moonlight. In Pokemon Silver, the description reads, quote, it always wears the skull of its dead mother, so no one has any idea what its hidden face looks like. This leaves us with the image of a sorrow-driven child who cannot bear the world to even see its face. So wrought with grief, Cubone pays memorial and tribute to its lost progenitor by wearing their mother's own skull as a mask, hiding their face behind a mask of sorrow. Cubone then evolves into Marowak, and the description of Marowak in Emerald reads, A Marowak is the evolved form of a Cubone that has grown tough by overcoming the grief of losing its mother. Its tempered and hardened spirit is not easily broken. And in Pokemon Silver, the description reads, It collects bones from an unknown place. A Marowak graveyard exists somewhere in the world, rumors say. Now, we are given a description of a Cubone that has grown into someone of greater strength, who has overcome their greatest loss, and also goes grave digging for weapons. However, I feel you can make a strong case against the perception given of Marowaks in these descriptions. To me, the Marowak doesn't seem to have grown stronger by the loss it suffered. It has merely reshaped its sorrow into anger and bitterness. The innocence and fear of the Cubone has been replaced by bitterness and resentment in the older grown Marowak. The Marowak is grave digging at this point. It's still hiding behind a mask. It's still haunted by the loss of its mother and can't seem to escape it. Someone who has moved on doesn't necessarily need to create an erasure of all memories of those from the past. We may and we should pay tribute to those we've lost, but we cannot be defined by those losses. Marowak is staunchly defined by the dead and seems unable to escape it. Moving forward through the tower, when you reach the stairway at the top, you're met with a spirit that warns, be gone intruders. A battle begins and it appears as just a ghost, but assuming you have the self scope item, you remove the mirage of the ghostly figure and you find that it's actually a Marowak. After the fight is over, the text reads, the ghost was the restless soul of Cubone's mother. The mother's soul was calm. It departed to the afterlife. 
Now we realize that as was mentioned before, this Marowak is actually the mother of the Q-Bone Mr. Fuji had rescued. The spirit was restless and haunting the tower. This Marowak had been standing guard by the staircase, trying to keep people safe from Team Rocket. And we... <clears throat> And when we meet and defeat the entity, it finds resolution in acknowledging that we, the player, can handle Team Rocket. In Pokemon Origins Episode 2, the Cubone and Marowak are actually reunited, and the Marowak feels even more resolute in having seen their child safe and well taken care of. So, this story can bring in some weird confusion about how exactly a Marowak can be a mother to Cubone, if Cubone is a Pokemon born necessarily of the death of its mother, and I'm not quite sure how to split these things up. Um, but for the sake of continuing on, we will go with the original explanation of how Cubone and Marowak come to be, and that they are an entity that is born of the loss of its mother. But I just wanted to share that example of the storyline from the game and the show as it's very interesting and, and kind of does help develop the ideas in some way. It's from the first pressing of Pokemon cards and it's the Cubone staring up at moonlight in a starry sky, barely withholding tears and beneath him the text reads, nothing in this world to put my trust in. This line is from a band called Stolas that I love and you should absolutely give a listen. But anyways, my dad, upon seeing the tattoo, regarded it as having a religious meaning. Uh, you know, as an example, God is all we can trust. Others could read it as something more, but my reading of this line, nothing in this world to put my trust in, I believe more so speaks to the idea that there is nothing definite in existence except for death itself. As soon as we're brought into existence, in every moment we're faced with the reality that death will find us at some point. And that there is nothing else that is definite. There is nothing else that is promised except for death. So this brings us to the philosophy section. So buckle yourselves in, it's gonna get even more weird. <laughs> every existing thing is born without reason prolongs itself out of weakness, and dies by chance. These not so uplifting but powerful words were written by Jean-Paul Sartre, as I had referenced earlier. This statement makes the argument that a world without a god is one of no inherent meaning. Sartre believed even in the face of death we have to manifest our own purpose in existence. Existence precedes essence, Sartre proclaimed in Existentialism is a Humanism. And what he means is that Yes, our life is without inherent meaning or preordained reason, i.e. our essence. Yet, we can create that and we must create that to continue living. We are free to do whatever we like or to do nothing at all if we so choose, but we are free to make that choice all the same. Even in the face of death, we must continue on living, for living is all that we have and that itself is a beautiful thing. As I get older, I grow less afraid of death. Sure, it may be inevitable and you know somewhat terrifying at times, but it's as inevitable as existing itself. If I were not to exist, I wouldn't have the opportunity to even be afraid of death. And once my death is come and gone, I will feel and fear nothing at all. Now, there are most certainly a plethora of negative things that come along with death, and that death is the negation of transcendence, as Sartre puts it. Uh, we are essentially reduced to our facticity. Hell is other people, is a famous line from Sartre's play No Exit. And this is another commonly misinterpreted quote of his. Sartre speaks a great deal of us as beings and our relation to the other. We are inextricable from the other, but we are still existing entities unto ourselves. As Sartre explains in an interview that was referenced in At the Existentialist Cafe, when we die, we are no longer able to transcend our own being. We are no longer able to make decisions, to change ourselves, to grow. We are finalized and fatalized. The purpose in existing itself is to make choices. It is to enact our freedom. And when we die, we are deprived of that option. When we die, we become nothing more than facticity, as Sartre puts it, which is the facts about us that are unchangeable. The givens of our situation, such as our language, our environment, our previous choices, and our very selves and their function as in itself constitute our facticity. Quote, 
So when Sartre says hell is other people, what he means to say is that we are reduced to facticity in the eyes of the other. We become memories that fade and break apart, but we are incapable of changing those memories and ideas of us all the same. We are trapped in memory, unchanging, lost in the dreamy haze of those that have kept us locked within their minds. This is remarked in other stunning quotes by Sartre, quote, to be dead is to be a prey for the living, and quote, to die is to be condemned no matter what ephemeral victory one has won over the other. Even if one has made use of the other to sculpture one's own statue, to die is to exist only through the other and to owe him one's meaning and the very meaning of one's victory. And one final quote from Sartre from No Exit, one always dies too soon or too late, and yet one's whole life is complete at that moment with a line drawn neatly under it ready for the summing up. You are your life and nothing else. So this relates back in an interesting way to the example of Cubone and Marowak. When someone dies, they become like a statue to Sartre, a monolithic figure that cannot truly be changed or rearranged. Cubone and Marowak represent this explicitly in that their entire mode of being is identified by the loss of their mother. The mother in this way has become a statue to them, if not even something they may unintentionally worship in a manner of speaking. They wear the skull of their own dead mother and even intrude on their burial sites to dig up bones just to stay connected to the past. Hell is other people indeed. If you were a parent and you had passed on, you would very much want your progeny to move on and continue living. It's clear that neither Cubone or Marowak have truly managed that. They're lost in the labyrinths of the past. This leads us to yet another Sartrean concept of bad faith, which applies poignantly here as well. Sartre describes bad faith in being in nothingness. Quote, the one who practices bad faith is hiding a displeasing truth or presenting as truth a pleasing untruth. Bad faith, then, <clears throat> bad faith then has an appearance, the structure of falsehood. Only what changes everything is the fact that in bad faith, it is from myself that I am hiding the truth. Sartre argues that we try to hide our freedoms by defining ourselves rigidly within contexts that make existence more bearable, that we try to remove responsibility and freedom from ourselves by hiding behind mistruths. In this way, Cubone suffers from a form of bad faith that is one we can completely empathize with. Any child who's lost a parent would suffer severe trauma and a lifetime of troubles to try and come to terms with such a powerful loss. Yet it is when Cubone evolves into Marowak that it seems they become even further entrenched in this identity. Not only has the Marowak continued the definition of themselves entirely by a loss that they've suffered, but they've grown older, dug through the graves of their mothers time and time again and used that suffering as a weapon. Cubone and Marowak are both inextricable from their grief. They are intertwined and identified with a loss that they have suffered. No longer are they free to themselves, but they are chained to the past in a way that seems impossible to rectify. While it may be obvious that death is inevitable, we need not live entirely under its shadow and live afraid of it, or live suffering the pain of that which we have lost. Interestingly enough, as I was writing this paper, I began sifting through a book about Sartre called Sartre A Life by Annie cohen -Solal. I'm probably pronouncing that totally wrong, sorry. So, the final chapter of the book, in a beautiful coincidence, is titled, In the Shadow of the Tower. The chapter title alone really struck me, so I read intently through every page, struck not only by the impressive writing, but also by the very sad and strange final years of Sartre's life. In the autumn of 1973, when Sartre is about 68 years old, he loses all of his vision. He can no longer see anything, or write, or take care of himself for the most part in his old age. Sartre's entire life was spent totally entrenched in his writing and sharing his thoughts on philosophy, politics, art, and literature. And for almost all of his life, he only had one eye to see through, and now there was nothing but darkness. In an interview he gave, he says, my occupation as a writer is completely destroyed. The only point in my life was writing. Everything in my past up to now has made me above all a man who writes and it is too late for that to change. The shadow of the tower, as it were, 
is both a literal and physical presence that seems to haunt Sartre's final years as he would pass away in 1980. The physical presence being the Montparnasse Tower, which again, I'm probably pronouncing wrong, sorry, which casts its shadow upon Sartre's newfound apartment. The tower still stands to this day, a strikingly sleek, black, dark, and mystifying, and it hovers above the city in a way that I could not have quite imagined before actually seeing it. Towers like this command some level of respect, of sacred appreciation, and maybe even fear to some degree. They stand above everything and proclaim, I am above all that exists here, and I will not be forgotten. This tower spreads a shadow over parts of Paris, and specifically over Sartre's final place of living, as his life falls under a shadow too. In this period of Sartre's life, he's grown disconnected from his, quote, Sartrean family. From many of his closest peers and colleagues, he has found he can no longer help himself and now must rely upon others, but he feels lost to them. His identity seems to be tearing itself apart at all ends, and this is when he meets a man called Victor Pierre. Victor's actual name is Benny Levy, so from now we'll just call him Benny. Benny is a young, incredibly intelligent man who has an impressive grasp on Sartre's work. He is also, however, described as vain, arrogant, and very informal. He becomes Sartre's assistant and attempts to help Sartre finish his works on Flaubert, among many other things. They immediately bond and become closer and start working together to create philosophical works. Benny becomes Sartre's confidant, his caretaker. They meet every day at 11 a.m. and they spend the days together arguing, sharing art and music, and discussing politics and life. Benny even makes great efforts to do things like just keep Sartre awake at this point in his life, to keep his mind running, and to keep him living, as it were. Benny is, by virtue, Sartre's last hope to continue to create and express himself as Sartre cannot write himself and he can't create in the way that he did before. In Existentialism is a Humanism, Sartre expressed the need for every individual to be steeped almost religiously in saying, quote, man is nothing other than his own project. He exists only to the extent that he realizes himself. Therefore, he is nothing more than the sum of his actions, nothing more than his life, end quote. He also adds, in life, a man commits himself and draws his own portrait, outside of which there is nothing. The Sartrean project is quintessential to existence, and there seemed to be a time where Sartre not only felt alienated from his colleagues, but that his project was to be no more. This project, later in his life, was given life again through Binny, and became Sartre's reason for continuing on and further drawing his own portrait. There are a lot of controversies surrounding their relationship, and some argue that Benny may have been manipulative of Sartre and used him for notoriety and fame. I won't get too deep into that here, but it's worth noting. Regardless, at this point in Sartre's life where he had felt very hopeless and lost, he for a time found his reason for living and continuing on with his project. Yet at the end of it all, Sartre appeared not to be so afraid of death or even think much of it. As he laid in a hospital bed just a few days before his passing, Sartre was thanking his friend for handing him a glass of water and he remarked, next time, whiskey at my place. He knew he would pass on soon, but he continued living optimistically as someone expressing their freedom, not afraid even in the face of death. Two years before his passing, he wrote, quote, Death? I don't think about it. It has no place in my life. It will always be outside. One day, my life will end, but I don't want it to be burdened with death. I want that my death never enter my life, nor define it, that I be always a call to life. So to end things off, where does all of this lead us with our interpretation of death in Lavender Town? Well, I do believe Lavender Town gives us a piece of the puzzle of death, but only a piece, and one I no longer find incredibly interesting. But different interpretations of it can lead us into interesting territory. Death, as remarked by philosophers, usually steers into different ideas. A nice quote from Plato applies here. I am afraid that other people do not realize that the one aim of those who practice philosophy in the proper manner is to, pr is to practice for dying and death. The purpose of philosophy is not absolutely meant to answer questions or give people every solution, but to posit how we should ask those questions or what questions we should be asking at all. 
We need frameworks to analyze the world through. We need thoughts on how to ask better questions and pursue intellectual disputes which lead us to growing accustomed to the harsh realities of existence. The long and short of it is that philosophy does not claim to know the answers to what happens after death, but that we should learn to be less terrified of it and to grow more appreciative of existence as we have it in the moments we live and breathe. We should learn acceptance of pain. We should look to find peace and we should resist expectations which seek only to ruin our happiness. We should seek not temporary solutions to any given problems and work to find peace within ourselves as we still exist, or at least that's what I believe. Death is not to be feared, it is to be understood and accepted. The shadow of the tower creates with it a poignant metaphor for life itself. In the example of Sartre, it marks a shadow cast upon the final years of his life. In the example of Lavender Town, this tower literally represents death itself, casting a shadow and fog over the town. The reality of our death is a tower, hovering above us, lingering there and almost constantly reminding us of its presence. Yet we are not so weak that we cannot face it or acknowledge it. So we remove ourselves as best as we can from death's shadow. We continue life under the sun and we continue living. It is only when someone is out of every option left to live that we must enter the tower. <laughs>